Good evening, I'm Katerina Georgieva. Here's what's making news right now. We uh, removed the connection points between the, uh, the body, uh, which is the cabin area, and the chassis, the frame rail, which you see behind us. With the level of staffing that we're at, I would say almost all of our officers' time right now is taking up assisting people complete the effort. So there's a lot of really exciting things that are happening for me um, in the art world and for my career, but the fact that the solo exhibition is happening in Windsor is just kind of the cherry on top. Thanks for joining us. Windsor police have made further arrests in relation to the Freedom Convoy blockade at the Ambassador Bridge. Two more people have been charged in connection with the protest, and police are calling them organizers. Jacob Barker has been looking into this and joins us now live from where the blockade took place. Jacob, what do we know about those just charged? Well, Kat, the names of the two individuals who were charged in this are William Laframboise and Dan uh, Nicole Danielle Malibu de Credico. Both are in their 40s and both are from Windsor, according to police. And what they are saying about those charges is that they have to do with uh, two vehicles that entered into uh, an intersection just up from here on Tecumseh Road West and Huron Church Road. And they blocked uh, the road, uh, preventing people who were trying to cross into the United States uh, across this border at the Ambassador Bridge. Eventually, all vehicle traffic was stopped here, and that uh, protest lasted for seven days. Eventually, it did come to an end because of a court ordered injunction. But auto groups at the time say that it cost them millions because of plant shutdowns. There were also more than 40 people who are, were arrested, uh, sorry, who were charged. Uh, because of what happened here and uh, what police are saying though about these two individuals is that they were leaders or organizers of the group and that's interesting because at the time Mayor Drew Dilkins uh, referred to the group uh, that was pr protesting here as a leaderless group so we did reach out to police today to ask for more uh, on this uh, some sort of statement or to ask questions uh, but we haven't heard back from them yet. And Jacob, tell us what exactly the two individuals have been charged with. Yeah, the two have been charged with mischief. Um, what we know about their court hearing is that it's supposed to be a first appearance and it's happening on August 25th. Thanks for this, Jacob. CBC's Jacob Barker live from the border for us tonight. And remaining at the border, where concerns continue about the Arrive Can app. The union representing Canada's border agents says it's slowing traffic and taking up time. People didn't even know the app existed or that there was a requirement. Some people simply say, will not fill it out. Uh, some it's partially filled out. Um, so you can imagine our officers, when this starts building up, how long the lineups could get at the border. And then our real work as, as officers in, you know, interdicting firearms and, and whatever we want to keep out of the country, that kind of falls by the wayside. So it is concerning. 30 to 40 percent of people at the Windsor border do not have the Arrive Can app filled out. This app was put in place by the federal government as a COVID-19 screening tool. Travelers have to declare their vaccination status before arriving at the border. NDP MP Brian Massey says it's harming local tourism and says it's not protecting the public. Now the app is not even working the way it should. Uh, it's outdated. It doesn't even cover the third and the fourth doses. Um, and it also has a number of different programming aspects that are wrong. So uh, to me, the app is something that should be um, removed at this point in time. Um, the mere fact that they're keeping it, and despite all the problems that it has and the problems that we're receiving, gives me indication that the government may be actually moving to this type of electronic documentation for the long term. News today on when young children can get a COVID-19 vaccine. Ontario will roll out doses starting next week. The Moderna vaccine has been approved for kids between six months and five years old. Appointments will be available to book next Thursday at 8 a.m. And you can book those on the Ontario website or through the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. The health unit suggests that parents talk with their doctors about getting that first dose for their kids. 
A gas-powered Enwin truck is in the process of being converted into an electric vehicle. In a few short weeks, it will be fully transformed and ready to hit the road. It's the first project of its kind for the company in partnership with the Automobility Canada Group and St. Clair College. CBC's Jason Vio takes a closer look. What's happening here is a test case, planned and executed over two years. We're trying to keep everything as driver-friendly as it was before. The goal is to see if gas-powered vehicles can be converted efficiently into electric ones. A lot of these vehicles have a long lifetime, and it's, it doesn't make sense that these vehicles uh, you know, would not be converted in order to still have the same or get the same benefits of an electrical system. The project is a joint venture between the company Canadian Automobility Enterprises, students at St. Clair College and the local utility company Enwin Utilities. It, it really is an investment. It's understanding, it's learning. The, the payback that we're going to get from the advanced view on what an electric vehicle uh, will do for us in a fleet perspective, what it's doing to help build knowledge within the college the next generation of engineers and, and fabricators. So in order to make this happen, they essentially had to pull the car apart. So they removed the connection points and then hoisted the Ford F-150 body off of the frame. And then you have the chassis exposed. They removed the 3.5 liter gas powered engine and other components and replaced it with eight massive batteries to run this vehicle and an electric engine. One obstacle to overcome, how to get the truck a charge if there's a lengthy power outage. We can't be on the side of the road with a, with a dead battery uh, while the community is looking to us to put the power in place. Up next is to get the truck back in one piece to test on the road. Ultimately, they hope this project leads to more commercial conversions, possibly in the farming or mining industries. Jason Vio, CBC News, Windsor. A true symbol of summer here in Canada has been put on the endangered list. The monarch butterfly, one of the most recognizable in the world, is now considered just two steps away from extinction by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. CBC's Katie Nicholson has the details. Pat Concessi has tried to make her Toronto garden as butterfly friendly as possible. There are purple pollinators and flowers that bloom late into fall because the monarchs need to, to collect enough nectar to get the energy to make their migration back to Mexico. And big rocks to shelter them from the wind and keep them warm. They retain their heat and butterflies have a challenge with maintaining their body temperature. So I will often come out and find butterflies sitting on the rock. Despite her best efforts today, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature added the monarch butterfly to its red list and categorized it as endangered, nearing extinction, because its population has shrunk between 22 and 72 percent over the last decade, threatened by habitat destruction and climate change. Canada hasn't yet listed the monarch as endangered, but conservation groups have been keeping a close eye on it. Changes in crops and pesticides have eliminated large amounts of milkweed, a vital source for the monarchs. One of the most, most important things that has contributed to their decline is the loss of milkweed. And here in Canada, uh, we can help support the monarch butterfly by, by planting more milkweed and by planting more native species that they depend on. That helps, but part of the reason the population is in peril is climate change. Monarch numbers are really tied to variation in year to year weather and that the conditions that are best for monarchs are becoming more rare. So um, the hot and dry conditions are not good for them. Butterflies need a source of water, as do many of the flying insects, so I just keep a, a, a pan of water there. Still, Concessi believes every little bit helps, even in a small patch of urban greenery. Like many people my age, I think about the world that I grew up in and how different the world my grandchildren are growing up in. And if there's something I can do to, um, to slow the pace of, of species extinction, that's something I want to do. Got a butterfly coming right through. Small changes not just for the butterflies, but her grandchildren too. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. 
Those beautiful butterflies are a big part of Windsor, Essex. We're the southern tip of Canada, and many come here before continuing on their journey south. The CBC's Mike Evans caught up with a local teacher who helps raise awareness about the monarch. You know, I, I think it's the fascination of how it goes into a chrysalis and the fact that you get to watch it go really transparent and get to come out and you get to watch that entire metamorphosis thing kind of go on. So you've been doing this for many, many years. In recent years, have you noticed a change in the number of, uh, let's say, caterpillars or eggs that you'll find out in the wild? Absolutely. Even on our property here, um, or if you know we're on a day trip to Leamington and what you can see, 2018, we had about just over 700 caterpillars that we were able to release and tag and go from there. And in June this year, we only found six. So in years past, we were able to bring in maybe 20 into the school to share with the, the primary classes in the office and, you know, the staff. And this year, there was only six we were able to find in the month of June. Mom would start, like, finding eggs, and then I would watch them grow, and that's how I started liking them. You probably heard from your mom by now that uh, monarchs are considered endangered. How does that make you feel? Um, pretty sad because, like, I love to watch them grow and stuff. So, what would you tell uh, kids your age about about monarch butterflies and what they can do to try to help them uh, become maybe not endangered one day again? Um, I would say like, don't kill like milkweed. Don't spray anything because there's stuff in danger and. You could keep them and hatch them. Amid a sweltering heat wave across parts of the country, including Ontario, dozens of nursing homes in the province have not complied with new legislation mandating air conditioning in all residents' rooms. It led one family to reach out to CBC's Philippe Lee Shannock. JC Ruhala is trying to keep cool during Toronto's heat wave, but she's worried about her dad. It's just horrible. The 77-year-old lives in long-term care. He has Parkinson's and dementia, and recently he tested positive for COVID-19. He's now in isolation in his room with no air conditioning, the temperature rising. He just doesn't look well. Now he's like, you know, trying to take off his clothes. Like he's hot, he's getting frustrated because he wants to leave the room. His wing is in lockdown. His daughter says he can't even have a fan in his room. Apparently it blows the virus around. Air conditioning has been a long-term issue in long-term care. Last year, Ontario Premier Doug Ford mandated all resident rooms have it. The deadline to comply was June 22nd, but seniors are still sweating. According to the province of 627 homes, 90 missed the deadline and are not fully air conditioned. Of those, 57, or nearly two-thirds, are for profit. This advocate says there's no excuse. Do we need to go down that road again of how for-profit consistently failed during this pandemic? The province says supply chain issues and COVID restrictions due to outbreaks prevented some homes from meeting the deadline. And it says all long-term care homes have designated cooling areas for residents. But this researcher who has studied the effects of heat on the elderly says that's not good enough. They're generating a lot of heat and uh, altogether that will heat up the room. And he suggests homes need updated rules that sets a maximum temperature at 26 Celsius. Rahala wants home operators and government officials to come spend an hour in her father's room. That's what I really need, like these people to first-hand experience what's happening in, in many of these homes. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. It's refreshing, it's cold, it's creamy. Here's how some folks are staying cool. A bit of ice cream in a heat wave. On a hot day like today, these seniors at Devonshire Retirement Home got a special visit from the Dairy Treat ice cream truck. Both seniors and staff got to cool down with a sweet treat, something that the residents look forward to on warm days. Got them um, popsicles in the meantime in some cold water, you know, so uh, I guess I took care of them a, a little bit. And is this a weekly thing? Uh, no, no, this is occasionally, you know, this is not uh, all the time. So, uh, but right now that the weather is nice and hot, yeah, we, um, we're trying to get as much as we can. Oh, I'm a fan of ice cream. When I have a senior funeral, I'm going to have to bring an ice cream truck and give everybody who comes to the funeral some ice cream. 
is always a good time for ice cream. A live look outside there. That heat though, it is going to persist. The heat warning expected to last until Sunday. We hope you found some ways to stay cool today, whether it be that ice cream or a ketchup popsicle or a dip in a pool. Dahlia Asher will be here after the break with more on what is to come. Stay with us. Windsor is a city full of creative minds, and tonight we want you to meet Jude Abu Zainab. She lives in New York State now, but she spent years in this city. Her exhibit, In the Presence of Absence, is currently on display at the Art Windsor Essex Gallery. It's an exploration of her Palestinian roots and features stories of migration and adaptation. As someone who is Palestinian and also Canadian, there are a lot of nuances to your um, identity and especially with identity politics as a Palestinian. Um, and so my work is very centered and nuanced in the idea of going into these very pristine, you know, the white cube, the institutional spaces that have historically been for and by white male artists and bringing in different narratives and perspectives um, 
for underrepresented people like myself as underrepresented folks in um, sort of the mainstream contemporary art space, um, we can take ownership of our stories and our narratives and create the archives that we want to see for us, by us. Um, and so that's what I'm attempting to do with this work is retell and archive these stories for Palestinians and people from um, the Middle East and North Africa. There was one piece with the Petri dishes that relied heavily on um, audience participation. I had put out a call for people to submit um, old archival photos from their you know, family albums and, and things that meant something to them. So if you actually spend some time with that installation, um, there's a lot of really beautiful family photos from people who submitted and people that I know and people that I don't know. Um, it just becomes a very interesting way of capturing that moment in time and history. And so I'm also interested in this archival process of how do we, how do we capture these stories and these moments that are often maybe forgotten or neglected or not part of these mainstream institutional spaces? Um, and how can we present them in this really alternate but still beautiful way that captures the essence of our culture, our identity, our histories, our politics, and all of those things. Also presenting this body of work and producing some of it in Windsor is just so poetic and meaningful to me because of my um, connections to home, to Windsor. My work is also very much about um, placemaking and belonging and thinking through different identity politics when you're trying to capture what home is and what it was and what it could be. And Windsor is very much part of that equation for me. When I do think about my personal experiences and my attempts to be grounded and rooted and finding that, that place that I call home or maybe even home away from home. Dahlia Ashri is here now for a look at our weather forecast. Dahlia, yesterday we were anticipating a big storm. We dodged most of it for the most part in our city. Yes. Uh, and today, a really nice day. So what's ahead? Well, Katerina, humid, hot, and that's going to be the story, really, going into the weekend. I mean, we just saw that art exhibit, maybe a chance to even head indoors at some point. But let's start off with what to expect. So like I said, some humidity is going to be approaching and some damp weather. So like I said, you might want to head on over to that exhibit to take cover for a bit. But first, let's see. Windsor, 31 degrees. That's the hot spot along with Sarnia. And with the humidity that we had today, that's 36 degrees. So that Humidex really taking up those temperatures and really ramping it up, making that muggy heat. But I mean, who doesn't like some heat, especially in the summer? That's what we're looking for. Now, there is um, a heat warning in effect in Windsor and for the GTA as well. But the damp conditions will be making its way. So as we uh, wrap up Thursday, it's nice and clear. A little bit of cloud uh, cloud overcast as we head into Friday. As you're make, we make our way into Saturday, the weekend, a little bit of cloud coverage. But there we go. We have that precipitation activity making its way through. And that will continue until Sunday, about 8 a.m. And Sunday towards the afternoon, it starts to die down. The precipitation, you just have that cloud coverage. Now, as we head into overnight, what to expect? Will the temperatures cool down, get a little bit of a break from the heat? And it seems like you will, but that's when the rain starts to kick in. It'll be tonight, 21 degrees, Leamington 21, Sarnia 20, but clear conditions there, no rain in sight. As we head into the weekend, how is it panning out? Well, Katerina, like we were talking about earlier, it was hot today and it's going to continue like that for the next uh, few days. So Friday is gonna be 31 degrees, but with that humid X, it's going to feel like 36 and the heat is going to continue Saturday and Sunday so it's going to feel hot humid muggy why because the rain is there 60% chance of rain so prepare your umbrellas maybe hit up that exhibit that we just saw earlier Monday 28 degrees a mix of sun and cloud 29 degrees so we're starting to see the temperature start to cool down just a little bit but we still have that heat which is always nice Katarina a great way to enjoy the weekend and a great way to kick off the work week absolutely thanks for that Dahlia thanks Katarina when we come back, we have the latest for you on the January 6th committee out of Washington. Stay with us.
The January 6th committee is holding what's likely to be the final public hearing of summer tonight. Members will be hearing from two former White House officials, and testimony will focus on the actions of former President Donald Trump as rioters stormed the Capitol. Journalist Kate Fisher has this report from Washington. 187 minutes. That's the time between when former President Donald Trump made a rousing speech to his supporters on the ellipse Let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. Until he posted a video on Twitter calling on them to leave the Capitol. Go home. It's well known how most of the day unfolded, but for more than three hours, Mr. Trump himself went dark. The committee says that tonight it will reveal what was going on inside the White House as a mob attacked the U.S. Capitol. Two former Trump aides will offer insight. Former National Security Council member Matthew Pottinger and one-time Deputy White House Press Secretary Sarah Matthews. They both resigned in the aftermath of the insurrection. The committee will also show outtakes from a speech to the nation that Mr. Trump recorded on January the 7th, the day after the violence. Well, the, the president um, displayed extreme difficulty in completing his remarks, of course, you know, hours had passed when he could have simply taken a walk uh, for 10 or 15 seconds over to address the country and address his followers and tell them to go home. And people were beseeching him, begging him to do that. Committee members have said that tonight's hearing will offer the most compelling evidence yet of Donald Trump's, quote, dereliction of duty. But as yet, the Justice Department has not decided whether there is enough evidence to bring criminal charges against the former president. Look, no person is above the law in this country. Nothing stops us. Even a president. No per I don't know how to maybe I'll say that again. No person is above the law in this country. I can't say it any more clearly than that. There is nothing in the principles of prosecution, in any other fact. Tonight's hearing is the last to be scheduled, but the panel has left the door open for more, and it hopes to publish a final report in the autumn. Kate Fisher for CBC News, Washington. That is it for CBC Windsor News. For news anytime, go to our website at cbc.ca slash Windsor, and you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and have a great night.